And one of the ones that I had a drill sergeant love to say, you're either going to get smart or you're going to get strong. Like you're either going to exceed in this training and do well, or you're going to be doing a lot of push-ups and running and sit-ups. And there's going to be a lot of things that you don't want to do until you get it right. I thought about that a lot, especially after seeing that as like, well, we couldn't be strong in that way. So we had to be smart, but there's this weird thing. Being smart made us stronger. That's Charlie Gilkey, and I'm Brian Falchuk. The Do A Day Podcast. Will you hear from the most inspiring people who have been through hard times, overcome them, and have turned around to help others with what they've learned? I'm your host, Brian Falchuk. I know because I've lived it myself. I've written about it in my book, Do A Day, and that's why I'm bringing you this show. Remember, today's a new day. Go out and do it. What's up, day doers? How you doing? Being smart made us stronger. That is, uh, that's some pretty strong words to live by and pretty smart words. Uh, that's Charlie Gilkey, and he is an amazing, amazing guy who has come through some pretty seriously tough times, both directly himself and for his wife. And he gets into all that. And uh, I think this is the first time he shared the complete story of everything that he's faced not just in his military career, but his life after that. And what he's built coming out of that is this amazing thing he calls productive flourishing, which is, it's a huge community. It's a a giant source of inspiration for a lot of people. And um, I'm just, I consider myself really lucky to have been able to be a part of that. I got to share the do a day story with him on his show a while ago. And um, yeah, I mean, when I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, I'd love to turn the mic around and have you back on my show because I know your story is strong and I know you deliver it in a way that just, it helps people, really, really helps people. And that's what you're committed to. And uh, he agreed. And that's why he's here today. So we will get into that in just a second. But I wanted to make sure that you all knew you really do need to go check out Charlie. And normally I save this for the end, but you got to I got to bring it up now, too. You got to go check out Charlie Gilkey's site, ProductiveFlourishing.com. He's written a book. He's put out a ton of content, and he's had just unbelievably inspiring people on his show. So you got to check him out. Um, Enjoy the episode. Take in what he has to say. Feel the power of his message. And um, um, I've actually listened to this a whole bunch of times before putting it out because I just I get a lot out of what Charlie shares. So I hope you will, too. Thanks for joining me, and let's get right into the episode with Charlie Gilkey. Wow, Charlie Gilkey, thank you so much for being on and uh, and, and agreeing to just share, you know, some of what you've been through and what you're creating with Productive Flourishing today. Hey, I'm super grateful to be here, and you know, a lot of these stories I don't think I've actually t- like told in in a podcast or in a sort of an interview format, so it's going to be new for me. Oh, that's cool. So this is a little bit of an exclusive then. I like that. Yes. All right, cool. Um, so we, we know each other from, from being on your show and, and honestly just listening to a bunch of it. And, um, I was just like, there's gotta be a lot more to this guy that would just make you incredible to pull your story out. And I, and, you know, luckily I wasn't wrong. So I know there's a lot you've been through your, your military background. You've had a lot of things that you've experienced, but also that you built and, and the positivity and the help that you're providing to entrepreneurs, business people, leaders, the whole nine out there. So what, what got you to all this? Like what, what is your do a day moment? Like how did you go through your struggles to bring you to today? Yeah. Well, you know, there, some people's journey has like one big thing that happens. And that sort of is what becomes what they end up responding and reacting to. Um, and so it could be the death of their spouse. It could be those type of things. But mine wasn't quite like that, right? So when it comes to that journey. Um, so as you mentioned, um, I could say that there there were a string of things that probably started, um, well, it depends on where we count things. But um, so we moved in, uh, we moved to Portland, Oregon in 2010. And that sort of set a few things in motion. Um, One of, well, the things were already in motion, but that was just a catalytic year. You know, you move halfway across the country, you remember that. Yeah. Um, But sometime that year, um, we were out on a vacation and actually it's the following year. So forgive me if I get loose on time because you you get through it and then (laughs) and then you move on. Right. I know Um, we don't know any of that. So if you get it wrong, no one's calling you out for it. 
Yeah, I that's mean, all right. I, I guess I'm the victor, and I get to write history <laughs> in that way, right? And Char- uh, Charlie, who's we? Who's we? That's we is me and my wife. So right, my wife right. Angela, uh, who's also a prominent feature on Productive Flourishing. So she does some of the podcasting with me. She does some of the writing. Um, but my wife and I, we moved from Lincoln, Nebraska, to Portland, Oregon, and about a year after that, um, she actually. Um, almost died of acute pancreatitis um, on the way back from a trip in Alaska. Actually, we were wow. um, we were out at a moose farm doing what you do in Alaska, and um, she was on an experimental medication for a autoimmune disease that she autoimmune disease that she has because it was the only one that worked for her, and it ended up triggering acute pancreatitis. Wow! And, and, and I'm guessing in the middle of a moose farm in Alaska, access to things to do about what she was going through pretty limited precisely yeah you and don't so just you walk don't to the it. hospital and there you go yeah so by acute i mean her organs and body was literally shutting down right um and so there we are we're going from like wasilla down to anchorage because that's the only place that you can get a really good doctor and um she's literally dying on the highway by me right um God. going down and um, you know, that was stressful for me, but it was super stressful for her, right? Because, you know, just going through that experience. Yeah. And sometime after that, about three or four months after that, um, she ended up having a PTSD sort of mental breakdown from that. Um, wow. And this is, you know, we, we are, we have our own business. She's a critical part of the business always has been. And so, I, for that period of time, lose my wife, you know, and a friend and things like that. But I also lose my business partner. Um, and not only that, you know, we moved away from family, we moved away from a lot of different things. And so yeah. um, I also had to reallocate my time from in the business to taking care of her. Um, and, you know, we've written about this, so this is not like, yeah. you know, this isn't. But, you know, the suicidal ideation, just being worried about where she is, her you know, not really, you know, she was on a cocktail of meds that kept her um, safe, let's put it that way, yeah. um, but not functional. You know, this and, is, go ahead. So, sorry to cut you off, but for, for a lot of people who have dealt with illness in the family um, the, or, or problems at work or, you know, like their job falling apart or something, that's one half of your life equation between, you know, the, the work-life balance but because your worlds are intertwined, there's no separation. So if one if one is faltering, it's your whole world, right? It's it's yeah. a complete picture. It's a complete picture, and I I should probably put in context that like we've been together since '97, and so we're talking 2011. So it's not like I mean I'm not trying to say people who are in a new relationship and this happens is it's different, but for us. Um, you know, we're very tight. Like, yeah. We're, we're, we finish each other's sentences. Sometimes we don't even need to talk because we know what the other one's thinking. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a really challenging period. Um, challenging is, is not quite the word that captures all of it. And, um, so yeah, we, so we're on this dual journey, right? Hers of, um, staying safe and in this world and, you know, coming back to it in that way. And mine in taking care of her being her primary caretaker while I'm the sole and only earner in the business, right? All sole and yeah. only earner of life in a small business context. That's the other thing, right? Yeah, so right. Like, it's one thing. And I'm not trying to, again, um, we were just talking about, oh, I should know her last name. Um, there's a TED Talk by Ash. I'm... So Ash Beckham has has written a story, and it's largely about having hard conversations and coming out. Um, and hers was coming out in her, you know, coming out as a lesbian, but we all have coming out stories, you yeah. know, like we're sick, or we, you know, um, maybe we have financial troubles, or maybe our relationships isn't, isn't working for us. But what I love about her TED Talk, and I'm kind of applying it here, I was talking to Brian a little bit about this earlier, is it gets so easy to try to com- like rate how hard your story is compared to somebody else's story yeah i get that all the time it's just hard you know yeah and people like well i haven't been through that so i can't i can't figure out what matters to me i haven't i haven't had a gun in my face so to speak like in you know literally or figuratively so i can't do that what i went through isn't tough yeah but her point is that it's just hard 
And so I want to say that because what I will, what I want to say about um, the hard of being a small business owner and having to take care of your wife and things like that is because like there's no there's no paycheck assured for you, you know. Um, there's there's no like group of colleagues that may be around you saying like you know you're going through a hard time so on and so forth. It's like you're still an entrepreneur and you still you know um, live off of what you what you create and earn. Yeah. Um, and if you too. don't, you don't, there's no paycheck coming otherwise. If yeah, you're not no building that business, there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I don't like the, I don't like the image of it because of, we're talking about people, but it really is in the sense that you eat what you kill. Right. And if you're not out there doing that, then that creates the additional financial hardship as well. Yeah. Right. Of like, here you are, this is happening. Then you're taking care of your partner. Um, you're doing the best you can to keep up with your business. Um, you're not growing to the degree that you, that you would expect, right? Um, you don't have the mindset to really seize opportunities. And so your finances and growth are hurting so on and so forth. And so that, you know, that's a, that's a really challenging period. Um, now that would be hard enough. Um, but shortly, at, you know, just right as she was coming out of that, we were getting our grips. We were both in a car accident at the same time. Wow. Same, um, same car or same two car, separate. Okay. Same car. I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. Someone rear ends us. Oh. Now, um, that's especially challenging. Getting rear ended and looking to looking to the side is really really challenging because your body breaks in three to four different places. Um, and so there we are again, um, in recovery. Oh. And um, I am one of those. Unfortunately, I'm a stress eater. You know. Um, yeah. I'm. A, and so I had already picked up some weight from the ordeal prior to that. Um, and then that happened and, you know, literally couldn't do it because of pain and, you know, spinal realignment and all those different yeah. things. So I couldn't work out. Now yeah. I'm, I'm, I've always been a strong guy. You know, I was in the military. Um, it's just part of who I am to be that guy. Um, and I loved it. And I lost a lot of my core strength. Um, picked up the weight, lost core strength, stopped working out, all those types of things to, to cover through with all of this. And still on top of this, Brian, um, writing a book and growing the business and coaching folks and, you know, podcasting and all those different types of things that you do. Um, you know, 18 months in the future, like we get through that. And then um, um, this became a story of hard things, but I guess that is the story of hard things, right? Um, then I had a really good friend and client who passed unexpectedly. And so I stepped in to help transition his business so his widow could take care of that. But it's just really going through that process of running PF, Productive Flourishing, and that other business at the same time. Um, wow. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the story of like what's been happening in some ways behind the scenes at Productive Flourishing. So yeah, I mean, we we've managed to continually ship new products and blog posts and, and do all that. Um, but you know, it, it hasn't, it's been challenging. Like it's been done in the context of challenges as opposed to despite or, you know, um, around those challenges, if that makes yeah. any sense. Yeah. So when you're talking about the, the vacation in 2011, when is, when is this rest of this chain? When is the car accident? And then when is so your, the your friend's accident, passing? Yeah, the car accident was 2013. 2013. Your book came out in 2014, right? Um, so the first the edition first came book. out in 2013. Yeah, 2013. Um, okay. Out, yeah, in in 2014. And then the friend's passing came in the fall of 2016. So roughly about every two years, wow. right? Um, to make things super fun. Yeah. Um, is, is when things happen. And so... Um, this this is I I think this is true for all people in their careers. But the other thing you got to think about from a entrepreneur sort of small business owner perspective is that there's a what can be super frustrating is building back up, building the team, building the momentum, building everything like that, and then having your legs kicked from under you. Yeah. <laughs> Needing to recover. Yeah. Doing all that, getting back into pushing the ball back up the hill like you know Sisyphus in that way, right? Yeah. Um, then you get to the top of the hill and then that damn thing rolls right back down on you again. Right. It's like, yeah. oh, here we go again. Um, and so that I think it's a 
it's a different challenge. I'm not going to say it's harder or easier based upon what we said, but that that's been one of the mindset pieces of like, okay, how does one like, cause you can see, and I think, you know, Brian, you've been through similar things. Like you can, there's this image of your world, sort of like this, all, this, uh, this other possible world where all that stuff didn't happen. Yeah. And where you might be had all that stuff not happened. And then there's this world that, you know, and you know that there's a delta, or you believe that there's a delta yeah. between that. There's a there's a big difference. And how does one reconcile that? How does how do you you know how do you deal with that? And that that's really a lot of the challenge to this day, because we're luckily a lot of that stuff is in the rear view, at least just the first and second order consequences of them. The third and fourth order are what we're working through now. Um, consequences of those types of things. Now, does that make sense? The difference between first and second order and the third and fourth order? Yeah, but I, I want you to talk through it a little bit more, just to make sure that people get it. Yeah, so I'll I'll talk generally, and then I'll talk specifically about my situation. So generally, right. like we normally can see the first and second order action. So let's take a car accident because I would I pull it. You know about your pain, right? You know, like that's the first thing that happens. You notice your pain, maybe some physical dysfunction. Um, you're laid up in your recovery for a little bit. Okay, that's the first order sort of effect. Yeah. The second order effect that happens for a lot of people that gets away from us is there may be financial repercussions that happen because of that, right? Um, maybe you're not able to work as much. Maybe your business suffers. Um, maybe you had to pay a whole bunch in phys- in, in and um, you know healthcare and doctor's offices and things like that, right? So that would be the second order. But then the third order after that is, is maybe not. Maybe it wasn't a short term hardship. Maybe like you took you had to take out debt or maybe you had to go bankrupt. We didn't have to, you know, to go bankrupt, but we didn't have to take out debt. Right. So then all of a sudden your reality, you know, 18 months from now is still dealing with this thing that happened 18 months ago. You've got these, these conditions that have happened. Okay. Further removed from it. But then the fourth order consequences is like, there are things that you can't invest in. There are different choices that you can't make because you're still paying off say the debt that came after the recovery, that okay. came after the pain, that came after the car accident. Is that clear? Yeah, I get it now. So it's it's the it's the dominoes one by one. The dominoes, right? The dominoes one by one. And in stories of change and transformation, I think most of the time, like we we give ourselves um, the permission, maybe to be in that recovery phase Um, because that's what you can't do anything else. Yeah. But I think as you get out of that recovery phase and I've talked to other people about that, that have gone through similar sort of things, right? It's after that though, that you think like, come on, I should be back in this already. Like what's going on? Yeah. Like that, that happened so long ago. Well, why am I still here? But it's really those second, third and fourth order consequences that we oftentimes don't see that because of that I'm here. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's usually not the initial earthquake. It's the aftershocks that do the most damage. Precisely. Yeah. We don't think about that. Yeah. Um, and we don't think about that, but we also don't give ourselves the grace, right? Um, you, it's like when you're an athlete and you're injured and you're out for the season, Yeah. the injury sucks and being out for the season sucks too. But the fact of the matter is the next season you might not get to start or you might not be the star player because there's someone else that was on the field playing during Mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. That's now better than you has more experience. You can't walk back into that next season and be like, I'm back. I should get my spot. No, that that spot's moved. Like someone else has it. And so there you are, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's been the sort of the trick and the challenge. And what I know now further removed from it is that, um, because we have such a negativity bias, we tend to look at, you know, I mentioned that sort of possible world over there and how, yeah. how much better and brighter that it is. But what we don't tend to look at is saying like, you know what, that really sucked, but there were some gifts that happened throughout all of that. Like I grew yeah, in different ways, not the way that I expected, <laughs> not the way that I wanted, yeah. but we grew in different ways. And so I can say now I am much more compassionate and empathetic and patient than I was before all of that. Um, in the sense where I work with a lot of creative change makers across different ways. And like, there's just an ability, there's just like 
not really understanding the hard battle that everyone is fighting. There's a quote, it's, mis, it's misattributed to Plato, but it's actually Ian McLaren who said, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle, mm. right? Be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And you fight enough hard battles yourself, you realize that, wait a second, before I get frustrated or snippy or condescending or anything like that, maybe they're going through one of those hard periods right now, right? And maybe that's how I should show up in this relationship yeah. as opposed to expecting something different. I, I completely agree. I mean, I think there's a few things that you've said that are all adding up into that phrase. And you talked about the negativity with which we as a society operate. There's a lot of judgment at play. So we, we interact with someone in a negative way and we presume maliciousness, negativity, all these bad things in their part where actually they just may be going through it too. And, and we have no insight into that. Or going back to your original point from Ash Beckham is like, maybe there's judgment about what those hardships are. It's like, well, I have it worse or they, worse than they do at least. Or, you know, I, what, I, what I'm going through is all that matters. It's, it's all judgment and comparison about whose hardship is, is harder. And actually it doesn't matter because it's all, each one of those hardships is only relative to us ourselves. It's not, a, it's not a competition. It's not a comparison. We're all responding to what we go through. Yeah, we're all responding, you know, by what we go through. And one of the things that that sort of held me together, right, throughout all this process is, again, I, you know, I'm a veteran. I deployed in, in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And there were days where just things are just terrible, right? Yeah. Uh, Genuinely terrible. Generally terrible, yeah. whether it's pain or whether it's, you know, having to pull Angela, you know, off of a one ledge or the other, you know, or whether just seeing that um, because of everything, I just completely spaced a phone call or I completely spaced, you know, following up with a client or, you know, um, and not in one of those small ways, but like, man, because of that action, I just lost thousands of dollars. Yeah. Right. That, by the way, we don't have enough of in the first right, place. Right, right. At exactly the wrong time. To, at exactly the yeah. wrong time. You know, and, you know, right now I'm talking, I'm looking out my office window, which, you know, we've been in the same place. And I look out the window and it's like, you know what? At least I'm not getting shot at. That's very uh, true. Because having been through scenarios like that, I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all going to be alive. Well, there, there are periods where I was worried about Angela sometimes, to be honest. Right. Yeah. Uh, but aside of those types of things, it's like, you know what? We're going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be a new day. And at least I'm not getting shot at, right? At least I'm not going to have to, um, I was, uh, I was also an officer. And so if anyone died, like I would be the one writing the letter, yeah. right? So yeah. like, I'm not going to have to write a letter today. You're not getting shot at and your people aren't getting shot at. Today. Yeah. 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 And so it was like, okay, this all sucks really bad right now, but at least like it could be worse, which is a stoic sort of thing. Right. Um, but it wasn't, I think a lot of times when we do that, it's like, we try to dismiss, and yes. I'm trying to be nuanced on this. We try to dismiss what we're going through because it's like at least we're not there. Yeah. But there's a, there's a difference, right? It's like, no, this actually really does suck. Yeah. It really, really does suck. But for me, it was more like, you know what? I've gone through harder. Yeah. And um, things were scarier and more uncertain and things were okay. We're going to make it through this too. And it sucks really bad. Yeah. That, that dismissal... Um... And that, that sort of stoic response, I, well, I think that's one of the reasons why we do it is it's a way of being tough. It's a way of gritting through it and, you know, trying to downplay it or dismiss it for the sake of, I don't know, maintaining, you know, just try, trying to bring some perspective and move on. The other reason why we do it, I found it, and, and I was absolutely guilty. I was absolutely guilty of this in respect of my wife when she was in the throes of her illness and the anxiety response to it, because I was pretty broken at that point too. I didn't want to validate what she was freaking out about because I was afraid that it would make it worse if she believed it to be true. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, she'd tell me like, you know, this is happening. Oh, she, she constantly be like, Oh my God, I think I'm dying. And I would be like, you know, I have to do everything in my power to, downplay that feeling because I don't want to feed into it. 
because it's only going to make her spiral more. And actually, that dismissal is the most dangerous thing I could have done for her. What mm-hmm. I needed to do was validate how she was feeling. You know, it, it doesn't. So validate for others, validate for yourself, even like we don't have to, we don't have to dismiss what we're going through to be okay with it. Sometimes actually you do need to just recognize it, give it its place and then move to what you can do about it, but don't just blow it off. Yeah. Don't just about blow it off. And like in that scenario, and we only see this in hindsight, right? So hopefully if you're going through something like this or a partner or someone you loved is going through, maybe you can learn from me and Brian's mistakes on this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just like, Saying like, yeah, like I'm scared too, doesn't actually say anything about the world, right? right? You saying I'm scared too, doesn't mean that she's more likely to die. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean that all the bad things that you're scared about are more likely to have, like it has no effect. It's the, it's the refrigerator door when you open and shut it, like the light's going to do what it's going to do. Right. But what you've said in that moment is I'm here with you. Yeah. Right. You're not saying don't be there. Yeah. Right. Or even and just, it's, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard. Hard. yeah it, it is. And you can even, even if you don't want to say you're scared, you can even just say that must be so unbelievably scary or that must be so hard. Just anything. I mean, it's, it's better if you put yourself right there with them because being alone and being at that level of fear is 10 times worse than, you know, having someone with you to, to go through it. Cause that's, that's the ultimate fear we have is we're in danger and no one can help me. Mm-hmm. And the reality is you're the one who can help yourself ultimately. But if you're in the throes of it, it can be hard to see that. And so you want that. Like that's, that's one thing she always said to me is like, you not only made me feel bad for feeling what I was feeling, but you left me alone. You know, I was going through this all by myself and I'm hearing that. And, and, you know, when I was still in it, I was like, that, I'm right here. Like, what do you know? I'm working and I'm taking care of you. And like, what do you mean? I left you alone. But I really did leave her alone in the way that she actually needed me to be there for her. And it's yeah. all this dismissal. Yeah. So, um, I typically call it like, you know, let go of the fixer. Yeah. It's the fixer. Right. Yeah, like, totally. You, you like a lot of times when someone's in in a situation where they're in pain. I mean, if they have asked you to fix them or to be in a problem solving mode, that's one thing. Yeah. But if in the scenario like you're scared or you're sad or upset, like there's a natural tendency. I think it's you know can be a bit of a gender tendency as well. I'm not going to go you know completely that this is what guys do, but guys often will do it. Um, it's like, well, it's my job to fix that. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Right. I mean, if you can, if you're doing something stupid, then yeah, stop doing that. Right. Um, but a lot of times it's like they don't need fixing. They need to be seen. Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes fixing them objectifies them in a way that like they're, they're a little machine that if you just turn the knob a little bit more, it's going to do what you want it to do. Yeah. Which really sucks if you're in that position where yeah. you want to be seen. And you, you know, how many spouses have been, you know, like the way the story goes, is like you've been nagging me about this forever, right? So how many spouses are, are nagging the other spouse, whether it's well-intentioned or not? And then the other spouse goes and, and sees a professional, you know, goes to the gym and sees a personal trainer or goes to the doctor or goes to a psychiatrist or whoever they go to who tells them exactly what the nagging spouse has been saying the whole time. They're like, oh, yeah, they said I need to do this. And they were absolutely right. And it's like, I've been telling you that for years. It's not your role. Like yeah. you're, you're not, they didn't hire you to fix them. And that might be really annoying and you might want them to do better. And you might, it might be for all the right reasons and for love, but that's not what your position is. And that, that's a really hard thing sometimes to come to grips with, especially you live your life day in, day out with these people. You see them, you see what they're doing. You see when they're harming themselves, but that's not, that's not what your role is. So if you can just be there for them and just validate and, you know, put your arm around them literally and figuratively and maybe help them towards the people whose role it is to do that, that, that gives them the support they need and helps them down a path of, of actually helping to fix them. But you're not the one who's going to do that nine times yeah. out of 10, nine times out of 10. Absolutely. I mean, I could say that your spouse having a therapist is one of the very best things for your relationship, right? Because it, it's not that it lets you off the hook, but it makes it very clear 
that you're not like they've got someone to do that for. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, Angela still, um, you know, she sees it, she sees the therapist and, um, sometimes we'll be talking about things. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you should be comfortable with me saying this, but, um, sometimes we'll be talking about things. I'm like, Hey, maybe you want to talk to, you know, Michelle, who's your therapist yeah. about that. Like that might be something put on the agenda there. And she's like, Oh, that's a good idea. Right. And it's not means that I don't want to talk about it. It just means that like, maybe that's, that's the, the better venue. Right. And then she'll come home and sometimes we'll be over dinner and I'm like, Hey, did anything come up during therapy that I might need to know. Right. Um, now we have a different relationship. It's not, you know, like I'm still taking care of her or anything like that, but it's just because I think the, the understanding that we have there is that, um, her relationship with her therapist is that container for things. And sometimes there are things that I might suggest that she talk to about that. Right. Um, and sometimes there'll be things that come from that, that I need to know, because, you know, it's like, not that I need to know that it was about her, but it's like, oh, we need to have a conversation about X. Yeah. And like, okay, well, let's have, like, let's figure out when we're going to have that conversation. Um, you know, another thing that happened was during, during this whole, you know, especially Angela, we call it a reset period, right? Um, okay. We don't really like the language of breakdown and things like that. It's a handy way of saying it, but we like reset better. Okay. Um, so during the reset period, there were times where I knew, for instance, that she had some friends that supplied the right type of comfort and energy and just, you know, the type of healing that she needed that I couldn't because of, you know, they were her girlfriends and just the way they showed up. I didn't have that energy. Right. Yeah. And so it would be times where I would be like calling them and saying, hey, I'm just wondering, you know, um, you know, Angela's kind of going through something. Um, you know, is there a way that you guys can go out for dinner or something like that in the next couple of weeks? Right. Because I knew Angela in that period of time, like she wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. Right. Um, and again, I'm not trying to, I know that sounds like the fixer thing, right. Um, we, we had conversations about ways that I could support Angela and this was one of those, right. So I had her permission to do these types of things. Okay. Right? That's really important because uh, otherwise you're meddling. You're so meddling. It, it's, it, be honest about it, tell them, you know, and, and be open about what you're doing. Because if they yeah, find but, out otherwise, then you're in trouble and it ended up backfiring. So just be transparent. Just be transparent. And in, in that scenario, she was on a cocktail of psych meds, right? And thinking, you know, I need to schedule something two weeks from now to go out with my girlfriends. Like that, that's super challenging in that period. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, you know, the thing about it is, but the reason I pull that up is, again, recognizing how you can help. And how you can't, mm. you know, like there are certain things that she needed that I couldn't provide. And I have no problem with that. Right. Cause I'm, I'm not the one source of, you know, the one source of everything she needs. That's a terrible way to end up in a relationship to that. If you ask me like, where you're the sole source of everything. Yeah. It's one sided. So, yeah, it's, it's well, it's one sided, but you're also like, we're not supermen, right? We're not pe like, we can't be all things to any one person. Yeah. Um, and so just acknowledging that and being like, okay with it. And, um, you know, has having some good conversations about like, how do we get you what you need when you need it, as opposed to one, here's what I think you need. I'm going to go make sure it happens. Right. Don't do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, unless you've had that pre conversation, it's like, this is what I need and I need some help. Okay. Then go do that. Right. Um, so just being, as you're going through things, but I think, it's also applying that for yourself. I want to pull it back to us because I know I've been talking about Angela and her stuff, right? Um, but it was also for me, it's like, okay, there are things that I need that Angela can't provide right now. There are things that I need that I can't do because I can't go to the gym right now. So what am I going to do about that? So like during the car accident period where I couldn't go to the gym, I had to figure out a lot of micro movements, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to do you know, some push-ups, or I'm going to do some planks, or I'm going to do, you know, some stretching throughout the day, because I can't go to the gym. You know, there was periods after the car accident where I couldn't sit or stand for longer than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. And I will tell you what, it really sucks to write when you can't sit or stand for 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, what I figured out is I can't write standing up. Um, and so it's actually uh, really hard. People don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm standing up and talking now. I can do that. But standing up and writing, couldn't do it. Um, and so I could only do that for 20 minutes. But here's the thing. Um, when I get in the zone, 
and I'm writing, I will sit for, you know, an hour, 90 minutes yeah, and wake up out of it. And I'm in racking pain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, this sucks. Right. Um, and so learning, okay. Um, what do I, what do I need right now? What do I need to do? And how do I let go of this idea that this is, this is how it should be, right? I should be going to the gym three times a week. I should be, you know, working during these periods. I should be able to work a full, you know, a full work day. That's what, that's what should be happening, you know? And it's yeah. like, how do you stop shooting on yourself? Yeah. I was just going to say that. I didn't know if you were going there, but I was like, yeah, you're creating all of these, uh, these pressures on yourself that are just constructs of expectations outside of you. Yeah. But we would never do that to someone else. Yeah. Like we would never be like, dude, like I know you're in like racking pain and you can't sit or stand for longer than 20 minutes. And you know that you've got to go back and forth to doctor's appointments and you're pretty stressed about things in general and you're recovering, but Oh, by the way, yeah, you got to put in eight full hours, bro. Don't care. Yeah. Right. Um, Oh, by the way, you still got to do all this. Like we wouldn't treat people we love like that. Um, I, I won't get into organizational dynamics because unfortunately I think there are some times where that is what's heard yeah. or said. Um, but we wouldn't, that's not what we would choose to do. Right? Yeah, that's we would very choose fair. to be more humane. Yeah. We would choose to like encourage people to take care of themselves however they need to. Yeah. But just not with ourselves usually. Just not with ourselves, right? Because um if we if we do it, then somehow we're uniquely defective. Yeah, and we're there's probably for some of us, there's that going back to your Superman comment, there's that need to prove that, you know, just because other people might need a break, we we can get through it because we're something special. We're more yeah. we're more than that. Yeah. And you know, those debts always come due. Oh yeah. Um, I had to learn them so many ways, whether we're talking at the micro debt of like me sitting down and writing for an hour yeah, and then waking up and then coming out of that and being like, okay, so it looks like I'm going to be done for the rest of the day <laughs> or, you know, yeah. um, or, oh, oh crap, it looks like I'm going to be, um, taking some muscle relaxers and yeah. going to the acupuncturist like that. That's the rest of my day Yeah, or whether it's holding something holding a story or holding work or holding project for six months longer than you should have because you set out thinking this is the way things were going to go and committing to it in a certain way, having something happen to you. And all of a sudden, like you not changing the plan when reality changed under you. I tell you what, like reality always wins in a certain way. Yeah. Right? When, so if you have the choice between trying to change reality and changing your plans, change your plans. Yes. Yep. And and by changing your plans, you may affect a change in reality. But if you continue, yeah, I mean, if you continue on the same path when the situation has changed, guess where you're heading? It's not to success. Yeah, it's not to success. And I mean, we work with a lot of creative people, Brian, you know, so like, I know we have this very tenuous relationship with realism, with reality, you know, um, because yeah. it's our job to change reality in that way. But what I mean by that is, if you expect it to be done in three months and you've been edited in three months and you're not done, you can't change the fact that you're not done, right? Yeah. There's nothing you can do about that. The only thing you could do is change your plans and change your expectations. Yeah. Um, and that's just where it is, but we don't want to let it go, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, going back to the pattern of struggle, that you went through and we were talking before recording about, you know, is, is it the, is it the one big thing or is it this sort of this pattern? And I think one of the reasons why I, I thought your story would resonate a lot and we get to get into what you work on now and how you're, how you're benefiting people by doing your work. But just for your story, I think one of the reasons why it resonates so strongly for me is it's this series of difficult things that any one of them is, is very rough. Like there's nothing minor about it. It's not like, Oh, and then it was raining, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it's, it, this is all real major stuff. And if you look at the, the pattern of it, like you said, it's about every two years, it happens again, you know, something big goes wrong. And I think that's how a lot of people face life is this. Why me? You know, why is it always me? Why am I always going through this? 
kind of feeling. And through your story, what I hope they take is whether there's this pattern of difficulty hitting over and over again, or it's a one-time thing, or it's little things or whatever, you can still come through it. And you can't, I mean, you were talking about the, the lessons that you learned from it, the ways that you've grown, the opportunities it's created. I, I just think that stands out so much because a lot of people don't feel that way, you know, and ultimately that is a choice and you can say, well, but my situation is so hard. It's like, you know, listen to your story. I think your story qualifies as hard enough for people to be like, maybe I'm making this harder than it needs to be. Maybe I'm insisting on this being too much and not being something that could be opportunity if I'm willing to grow from it. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, it wasn't until I, we were, so for the car accident, we ended up uh, like securing a lawyer. Um, side, side thing about that, if you're ever in a car accident or anything like that, um, one of the things that they might tell you to do is to stop posting on social media and yep. on your blog about what you're going through. Yep. Um, Cause that will be used against you. Now, I am a blogger, blogger and public writer and I have a social media profile. Yeah. So that immediately meant during that during that during that period of time that there were like I couldn't say had a great time camping this weekend. Right. Because you must be like, fine. Because you must be fine. And so there's this whole part of my life that like from a legal protection perspective, couldn't talk about it. It wasn't just that I was afraid to be vulnerable and say I'm hurting right now. Um, and so it's. That, so I'm just going to put that out. as That, that was frustrating at the time uh, because like you lose in some ways, especially in the, in the areas in which we operate, like people kind of want to like know what's going on. Like, what are you? Who are you? Yeah. And there's a whole part of that. They, they can't see while you're under that. But it, eventually we ended up, um, you know, going for a settlement for it. And um, I ended up having to create a case for what our economic loss was. Yeah. I'm trying to make a long story short here and failing miserably. Um, but what I noticed, and I didn't notice this until afterwards, is that every year throughout this period, we actually still grew our, our revenue by about 15%. Wow. But more importantly than that, our profitability was raising as well, right? So we were still growing the business and we were running it better throughout all of this. Um, and, you know, I looked at that when I made that report. I was like, that can't be right. Like that was hard. So you didn't get it while you were living it. Didn't get it that, while. Yeah. Living it. But I'm like, what happened? Then it's like, well, we had to work smarter, right? We had to focus on the fewer things that that mattered most. Like we just didn't have a lot of time to waste. We didn't have a lot of like, you know, we couldn't try a bunch of different projects and see which stick. We had to like stick to the knitting and make sure it worked. Um, yeah. And I didn't have the revenue to hire a bunch of people and things like that. So. We yeah, you had to be more. careful on the expense side because it was a debt situation. So you, yeah, yeah and yeah. so it ended up after that. Then I'm like, wait a second, that's the other thing. Yes, there are these character traits like you know humility, like because that's the other thing. Like you re you figure out you know because you know is this all started happening when I was like 31, and you're still under that halo of invincibility, right? You're not quite in that I'm 24 and I'm yeah. a guy. And the world is just like going to like be crushed under my under my, my step, right? You're 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 a little bit more old, but you still have enough of that invincibility to you, right? Yeah. I figured out real quick. Wait a second, that's not really the case, right? Um, so you know you gain all those, but it's also like we got a hell of a lot smarter about running the business, not because we wanted to, not because we read you know the E myth. Um, not because it seemed like, you know, there was a post that, that some business dude online was talking about. We had to, right? We lost one of our partners and we lost about half the capacity of another. Yeah. Um, how do you make that work? You get smarter. Um, which does remind me of, um, in basic training for the army, um, drill sergeants say the funniest things. They're not funny at the time. Um, but later on they they crack you up. And one of the ones that I had a drill sergeant loved to say, you're either going to get smart or you're going to get strong. And what he meant by that is you're either going to take, like you're either going to exceed in this training and do well, or you're going to be doing a lot of push ups and running and sit ups. And there's going to be a lot of things that you don't want to do <laughs> until you get it right. So which yeah. are you going to be? And I thought about that a lot, especially after seeing that as like, well, um, we couldn't be strong in that way. So we had to be smart, but there's this weird thing. 
being smart made us stronger. Um, and so I forgot where I was going with that, but that that's where, like, if you're going through the, oh, to your point, there's also this Buddha story, Brian, you might, have you heard about the, um, the people who got shot with the poison arrow? I think so. It depends where you're going with it. Okay. But it's so, sounding familiar. I, I it so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at the time. So basically there's these two, um, these two people in the, in a Chinese army, let's just say to set it up quickly. And, um, they're going on the attack and all of a sudden the enemy start shooting a bunch of poison arrows at them. Right. And they're two different people standing side by side when they take off running, um, to, to charge the enemy. They both get hit with a poison arrow. One person gets hit with the arrow and looks down at it and he starts wondering like which archer shot him and why he was the one that got hit and what happens if he would have got hit in another little place and he starts rummaging and poking around. He's like, wow, like if it would have just went a little bit more, then maybe this happened. Why did all this happen to me? And eventually um, through all of his questioning and through all of his sort of rummaging, the poison takes hold and dies yeah. and he dies. And the other guy gets shot with the arrow, immediately breaks it, pulls it out the backside and keeps going. Yeah. Um, now, the whole point here is at a certain point, you got to figure out to what degree you can take a lesson learned from the arrow that you just got and which point of it is the useless poking at it that's going to get you poisoned and die. Yeah. Right? And, and that's tricky. That's a tricky balance because sometimes you keep doing the same dumb thing over and over again. Right. And you don't realize that that's creating the hardship in your life. Right. Yeah. Um, and so in those cases, you definitely want to say, like, why does this keep happening to me? But I would want to say it like in a different way that's more personal responsibility perspective. Like, what is there something that I'm doing that's creating this outcome? Yeah. What can I do differently to stop this from happening? What can I do differently to stop this from happening? Or what can I do different such that when it happens, I suffer less? Yeah. Right. Those are great questions. Yeah. Why is this always happening to me? Like the extra, like the universe putting its thumb on you or like you're the ant in the, in the universe's magnifying glass and it's just cooking you in the sun. Like, I think there's a certain point where there's a freedom in accepting that you're not the center of the damn universe. Yeah. Right. And that sometimes you just get bumped into, sometimes it's a random arrow. Sometimes it just random shit happens and drive on. Like, learn what you can from it, um, you know, take the blow, sort of roll through it, and, you know, keep going. It's, it's like the Winston Churchill quote, right? If you're going through hell, keep going. Um, sometimes it's just the best thing that you could do is just to keep going and not do the why is this always happening to me? And so that's that's one of the mindsets. Those, those three sort of stories or aphorisms are, are yeah. what we took during that period. Because I'm like, you know, we are in a car accident. Completely random sort of thing. This happens to people. It sucks really bad, though. We're in pain, right? What can we learn? Like, how is this going to, like, our life is going to be different, but what, is there anything we can learn from this that will make us stronger and better and make us more resilient? Right. And sometimes it's no. Sometimes you just, you drop the pan on your toe and it hurts. Nothing you can do about that. Um, but in those deep, dark nights of like, why is this happening to me? Why, like, am I being punished or anything like that? It's just like, that's not that's not useful yeah and it's not it doesn't drive you to change to do anything different it makes you a victim of your circumstances um and that's one of the worst things especially when you we make ourselves the victim now to be clear bad things happen to people and it's not their fault i'm not trying to say that right. you're responsible for for all the bad things that happen to you yeah um but sometimes bad things happen and it's completely random you're yep. in the wrong place at the wrong time um, and I learned that honestly from being a veteran as well, because the difference between you leaving this time and that time might make the difference between you going home and you not. Right. And it's random. It's like, you know, we got plenty of calls while we were on convoys where it's like, sir, I was, again, I was a commander or I was an officer where my radio operator would be like the convoy that left after us is now going through an ambush. Yeah. Um, or Hey, sir, the convoy that left before us is going through an ambush and they've, you know, and we need to go to the next checkpoint right, and take a defensive right. position. Now, in either of those cases, we could have been the convoy before or we could have been the convoy after. We just weren't. Yeah. And you do the best you can. 
and you drive forward, you know? Yeah. And whether it's the universe or someone else or yourself, like we can focus on all that. And there's a learning perhaps in, in some of those things. I don't, I don't know about the universe part other than accepting that, look, things do happen, you know, like what you're saying. But the point is it's happened and now you can do something in response to it. And you're absolutely right. Like looking back on it, you learned how your business was better because of what you went through. You had no choice but to be better, even though while you were being better, you didn't even realize it. And so much of it is in hindsight. And, and yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm like, I've got stories swirling through my head, like my own or a, another podcast I was listening to today where this guy was attacked by a shark in Sydney Harbor. Um, and it's, he relieved, he was a, a Navy diver in, uh, in the Australian Navy and he relieved, uh, one of his mates who was really tired. And so he jumped in the water in place of this guy and then the shark attacked. And it was like, you know, if, if he didn't do that, the other guy would have been the one to lose his hand and his leg like this guy did and, and listen to him tell the story. He's like, no, actually he was smaller than me. He wasn't in as good shape. He probably just would have died because mm -hmm. he wouldn't have been able to fight back. And it's like, so that, you know, every, every change changes a lot of things. We can't just sit here and, and why me and a oh, woe is me. Like you don't know what would have happened otherwise. Maybe something worse would have happened. You know, we presume that what we went through was so terrible. Yeah, it may be. And it may have been even worse. You know, you went through something, maybe you would have been the one not coming home. You know, there's, I, I think for the, for our veterans out there, you've seen more than most people will ever understand just how thin that line is. And, you could, like you said, like, well, I wasn't shot at today or I'm not going to be shot at today. That's a really thin line that you live while you're deployed. And I think it, it can get you to appreciate that at such a stronger level. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it's one of those things where like, you know, you know it acutely in those scenarios that you, whether, you know, a good day is a day that everybody, you know, right. gets food and, and gets to sleep and like no one, like, even if you did get shot at if, if everyone came home, you're, that's still a good day. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, there are better days, um, but there are damn sure a lot of worse days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We, we think, um, luckily, luckily, you know, eating my own cooking, I wrote a post about, about this long before all this started happening. And it was like, that the, the main idea was that something is different, would have been different. Doesn't mean that it would have been better. Right. 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 We assume that that parallel universe over there that I was talking about, that things would have been better. But we have no way of knowing that actually, right? Yeah. And lives are, you know, we, we human beings exist in paradoxes, right? Because on the one hand, life is long. And on the other hand, life is short. And both are true at the same time. Yeah. Right. We, yeah. we are still so close to this that we don't know if there's a sixth or seventh order consequence of something that happened that's actually going to be really, really good because of that. Right. And so it's, it's one of those things that you, you, you take the breaks where you can, <laughs> you deal with the hardships where you have to. Um, and then, and I, I know you and I share this cause we're so focused on the doing of the day and, and, and just making something happen, but you're just like, I've got today. What can I make happen today Yeah. to, towards these goals, regardless of what's going on. Right. And sometimes that's, you know what, the best thing I can do today to reach my goals is to lay up in bed today and recover because I overdid it yesterday or because I'm just in pain or because I'm just friggin' sad, right? Or frustrated or mad or not my best version of human. Yeah. And so it's not the, you know, log on to the computer and do the thing. No, it's like do something else. And that's the best way. And it's just it's super counterintuitive sometimes. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you. Um, but hey, that's why I wanted you on the show because I agree with you. So it makes it makes it easier to do the interview. Um, Charlie, what? It's just re real quick because I know we're, we're getting tight on time. But what what are you doing with productive flourishing? You know, how are you helping people? What is this about? And and obviously, you know, I know you've got the small business life cycle. You've got you you put out so much content. Just give people a feel for what your message is about. Yeah, so um, what we do at Productive Flourishing is just really help 
creative powerhouses. We call them creative giants. I can go into a long story, um, but that's also on the website. But create creative or to help creative powerhouses do their best work and be their best selves, which I know is really broad, but we have a very much of a focus on the practical steps, strategies, techniques, and habits that help people go from idea to done and the focus on the things that matter most. Um, and so a lot of folks know us because we have um, some really popular planners. Um, we call them the momentum planners that do help you do that goal setting, visualization, chunking, sequencing, and, um, you know, doing that's going to make it happen. Um, you know, a lot of our folks, you know, you mentioned small business life cycle. Actually, I mentioned small business life cycle. A lot of folks do turn towards entrepreneurship, but we don't necessarily have that whole idea that like, if you're an entrepreneur, you're better than everybody else. You're just a yeah. particular type of creative powerhouse yeah. that's doing a particular type of thing and you have to show up a particular type of way. Yeah. Um, but that's really what we focus on. A lot of um, a lot of root cause stuff too, right? We, there, while as much as I love the industry of personal productivity and self-improvement and things like that, um, my sort of reflection on it is that too little of it focuses on root causes of why we do what we do and what needs to be in place for us to be successful and how we make deep changes in ourselves that help us flourish. And that's really what we do at Productive Flourishing. I love that. Um, I love how much action orientation there is. I love how much you're helping people structure how to get to that and then execute against it. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that strikes me is when you're talking about like the value of being an entrepreneur and that's not the only great thing to be. Um, I, I know you've got, you know, in your book is, is in the title is small business focused and, and some of the work you're, you know, is, is small business focused, but actually, there are a lot of lessons for entrepreneurs and small business that I don't care what size business you're in, whether it's your business or someone else's, you can still be inspired. And those lessons can make you that much more powerful in your business, regardless of its size. Cause there's something, especially when you're talking small business and entrepreneurship, that's about hunger and drive and execution and values that sometimes we lose when we're a cog in a bigger business or always. Yeah. Um, so that, that, the message just because small business is in the title, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get inspiration and guidance that makes you that much better, regardless of whether your business is small, medium, or large. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and the, my take on the whole entrepreneurship, small business thing is that for creative folks whose livelihood depends upon their ability to ship, right, and get stuff out to the marketplace, yeah. um, it's, it's not that it's di it, what, what's different about it is that there is an economic um, correlation to your personal responsibility, right. meaning right. that if you're not doing your work, if you're not showing up, if you're not being courageous, like you see it in your paycheck, right? Um, which I'm not saying you don't do that on an organizational front, but it's, it can be a lot easier to hide in an organization, um, but you don't have that option as an entrepreneur and small business owner. Yeah. If, if you're not doing it in a big organization, and you end up getting fired, you still get your paycheck every time they pay before you get fired. Yeah. If you're, if you're, you know, an entrepreneur or solopreneur, just you, and you're, you're acting in a way and running the business in a way that would get you fired if this wasn't your business, guess what? There's no one paying you because there's no money coming in or there's too much going out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It absolutely. Gets hidden. So that, yeah. So it's just, that's why. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a champion for all creative people. Um, and you know, my, my sort of slice of the plan is with creative powerhouses that just really are action focused. And by the way, that comes from the sort of neo Aristotelian perspective of we become by doing. So like people are like, I want to become an author. How do I become an author? Well, you write a book, right? And I know that sounds very simplistic, but that's really what you do. You write a book. Um, now how you do that, that gets more challenging, but we become the things that we want to become by doing, not merely by thinking about it, not right. merely by hoping or aspiring. And so that's why I'm like, okay, if we want to change the world, let's get busy in the doing of changing the world. If we want to change ourselves, let's get busy in the doing of that, as yeah. opposed to just the thinking and cogitation about it. Yeah, I love it. Charlie, where can people find all of this brilliance? I mean, your your site is huge in this whole productivity and and like th that whole space is one of the top sites. So where where are they find you at? All roads lead to productiveflourishing.com. 
And so that would be the first place I'd send someone. Um, if you're on Twitter, I'm also at Charlie Bielke. Um, but if you can only remember one, go to Productive Flourishing because you're going to get m- way more deep and you know coherent stuff there than you might get on Twitter. Yeah. And, and of course, you link out to all that stuff there too. So if you can't... Absolutely. If you can't remember how to spell Charlie or Gilkey, hopefully you can re- remember how to spell productive flourishing. And of course, I'll link to all that stuff too. But um, I like it's not just because I was on your show or you were on mine. Like I've been following your stuff. There's a ton of value in that, and I think from this conversation, people get that too. Like this is this is deep. I'm I'm feeling driven, um, and yeah, just just fired up by this. It's awesome. I, I appreciate how much of your story and yourself you shared. Um, and how much inspiration just naturally came out of all that. Cause there's some serious power for people who are in that struggle. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, it's, it's been a blast and, and thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Charlie, thank you so much for being on the show. And I think there's so much inspiration from what you said that leads right to how I always close things. But today is a new day. Go out and start finishing what matters. Ah, all right. Making it your own. I like that. Thanks, Charlie. Have a great day. You too. Wow. There you go, Charlie Gilkey. I told you up front, this is a big one. You know, it's definitely a strong, moving message. You definitely need to go and check out Charlie at ProductiveFlourishing.com. They just, he, the whole scene, they put a ton into that site and into the content. And into the podcast, not just my episode, of course, but lots of other ones too. It's worth it. So ProductiveFlourishing.com. And of course, as always, you can also check me out at BrianFalchuk.com, DoAdayBook.com. Follow me up at Brian Falchuk on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. And if you haven't yet, definitely pick up Do A Day. It's all this kind of stuff. It's, it's the kind of inspiration that, you know, you should be getting from guests like Charlie to make you think about how you can change your own life. And that's the whole reason I put it out there. And it seems to be having that effect. If you like this podcast and you think it's having that effect, the book does even more of that. You can get it at doadaybook.com or anywhere you'd like to pick up your books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, whatever. And it's on audiobook too. Um, so yeah, go check it out. Subscribe to the podcast. If you're not already, like the podcast, review the podcast. And once again, just go check out Charlie's stuff, Productive Flourishing. So with that, I will remind everyone, today's a new day. Please, for your sake, go out and do it. Take care.